Makes you think. Makes you think about the people in your life. And I think of Neil. And if he was sitting there right now, what would he say to me? He'd say, John, what's it about? What's life about? If you don't go through it as a man's man. You see, suck it up. Take the fall. Do the time. That's made you who you are. That makes you what you are. How long we've been around this thing of ours? This goes in Austria. 120 years. I mean, what's it about? It's about the rules, parameters. When you take the beating for the fun, you don't run, you don't lay down, you don't betray who you are, what you are. Self-esteem. Self-esteem is basic. You pick it up in the street. That goes with the street. You got to remember Angie here. I love this guy. I loved him. And he was stupid. He never listened to me. He always wanted a goddamn dope money. He never rolled. Do you know that? He never rolled. My brother Gene, Joey, the Mick, they don't roll. They're doing a thousand years now. They don't roll. They don't rat white. That's the rule. You don't break. You don't rat. Chapter 5. Take care of him, Nino. John Gotti had kept a very low profile with all of the drug dealing going on with his crew. The wiretaps and bugs picked up nothing which implicated him directly in what was happening. He did show up for the funeral and internment of Salvatore Ruggiero, but that was out of respect for his family, and it would be a stretch for the government to make anything more out of it. While not directly involved, Gotti likely benefited from the trafficking from the money his crew kicked up to him. He had to know that Angelo was dealing off the record with heroin. Gotti's own mob intelligence was fairly well-tuned to give him that information, but Gotti's approach was kind of a mob don't-ask-don't-tell when it came to probing too deeply about the narcotics money. At one point, Gotti made a big show, according to one informant, of expelling Mark Ryder from the Bergen crew because of drugs. But the ban wasn't enforced because, as the informant said, Ruggiero and Ryder still dealt in drugs. Gotti's so-called chasing away of Ryder seemed rather half-hearted. According to Andrea Giovino, who as a young and pretty Italian woman from Bensonhurst gravitated to some of the big mob characters of the day, she claimed to have partied often with both Ryder, whom she said she had a relationship with for about a year, and Gotti in early 1985 at the trendy Club A in Manhattan. Party night for Gotti and his compos at the club was usually Tuesdays and Thursdays. A spitfire, when provoked, Giovino recounted in her book, Divorced from the Mob, My Journey from Organized Crime to Independent Woman, how she pummeled another woman in the club with a liquor bottle and got Gotti's stunned admiration. Again, an associate of Gotti, who asked to be unnamed, disputed her recollection and said she never partied in Gotti's presence. In the summer of 1987, DEA agents and NYPD detectives surveilled Ryder visiting Gotti's base in Ozone Park, the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. The incident showed that Gotti didn't keep his arm distance from drug dealers like Ryder, although he was never linked to drug trafficking. Either he had to be the dumbest boss alive or he was involved, was how government witness John A. Light, once again being no associate, viewed possible explanations for Gotti's behavior. But others were not so sure that Gotti had any direct involvement in drug trafficking, but likely took what was given to him. I think he was just a profit taker, opined Jim Hunt, years later about Gotti's relationship to the drug dealing. Guys around him had money. Eddie Lino, a wealthy guy. John Conegli, a wealthy guy. They were the movers and shakers. They were his guys. There's no way he, Gotti, was not getting some kicked up. Looking back, Hunt believed that the drug dealers in the Bergen crew never told Gotti the money he got was from heroin deals. If they were kicking up enough cash to Gotti, he knew it wasn't from bookmaking or the other crimes. Gotti's refusal to talk openly about drugs, either on the telephone or in person, is why he wasn't ensnared in the indictment, said Hunt. A former FBI agent who took part in the Ruggiero probe also told the author that there was no evidence that Gotti was involved in drug deals. But at the very least, Gotti had a willful blindness to what was going on. It was the same sort of behavior which decades later officials would later allege about some of the big investors with Wall Street scammer Bernard Madoff, who were viewed as surely having to know that all of their fantastic brokerage account returns were too good to be true, and thus ill-gotten gains. That sculpted ignorance made them in some sense complicit in Madoff's crimes. As a legal concept, willful blindness is defined as involving conscious avoidance of the truth and, as the dictionary says, gives rise to an inference of knowledge of the crime in question. 
Knowledge of a crime is not the same in legal sense as participating in it, and on that score there is no evidence Gotti trafficked in drugs. To put it another way, Gotti, given his shrewdness about what his men were doing on the street, could take a position like police captain Louis Renault, the Claude Rains character in the film Casablanca. Renault expressed shock and horror that gambling had been going on in Rick's cafe, yet really knew what was going on in the casino since, in the next breath, gladly accepted his winnings from playing the roulette wheel. Money was what the mob was about, and frankly Gotti wouldn't have cared where it came from as he stuffed it into his pockets. Beginning with Angelo Ruggiero. The drug men in the Gambino heroin trade were all people Gotti had grown up with on the street. They had shared a lot together, and it wouldn't have been easy for Gotti to turn his back on them. The men in Gotti's crew had a long common history through his steady, fortuitous rise to a position of power. Gotti's old Fulton Rockaway crowd migrated with their Gambino crime family mentors, the Fatico brothers, to a new social club on 101st Avenue in Ozone Park, the Bergen Hunt and Fish. But by 1972, Carmine Fatico, the more powerful of the brothers, had a series of legal problems, notably a loan-sharking indictment on Long Island which hobbled his ability to attend to business at the Bergen. As journalists Jerry Capisi and Jean Mustaine noted in their book, Mob Star, Gotti was anointed to fill the leadership void at the social club in Fatico's absence, even though at the age of 31, Gotti wasn't even a made man. As a result, Gotti had a great deal of face time with Della Croce, who was the most powerful man in the crime family after Gambino himself. When Della Croce had to go away for a stint in prison, Gotti became the Bergen's man to talk directly with Gambino. At the club, Gotti relied on his brother to run the facility. According to former FBI agent Bruce Mao, Gotti also turned to Ruggiero to work as the administrator of the crew activities. Of Gotti, John was not a good administrator, said Mao. Gotti seemed more interested in being the wise guy boss. If Gotti impressed Gambino with the way his crew brought in money from hijacking and its other street rackets, it took something more important to solidify the young gangster's importance for the old boss. Homicide. The story about the killing of James McBratney in May 1973 is one of those tales often told about Gotti, so it need not be delved into very much here. McBratney was an Irish street thug who had the reckless effrontery to kidnap Emmanuel Gambino, the nephew of Don Carlo himself. McBradney and his cohorts demanded a $350,000 ransom and eventually settled on $100,000, which the victim's wife paid, thinking it would secure the release of her spouse unharmed. The money went and so did Emmanuel. He was dug up from a grave in New Jersey in January 1973. He had been shot in the head. The elder Gambino, so the story goes, turned to Gotti to avenge the murder. On May 23, 1973, Gotti, Ruggiero, and an associate named Ralph Gallion walked into Snoop's Bar and Grill on Staten Island. It was then that the trio walked over to McBratney, who had been nursing a drink at the bar, and attempted to remove him from Snoop's. Angelo had a pair of handcuffs. Gallione was armed with a handgun, and Gotti provided the muscle. All three surrounded McBratney and acted like cops, telling him to come with them. Anything that was supposed to happen would be done away from Snoop's. But the combative McBratney resisted, and when he did, Gallione fired at him three times. McBratney fell dead while Gotti and company fled, but now thought having been witnessed by a number of patrons inside Snoop's. The killing was done in a room full of witnesses, a major tactical mistake. It took police about two months to arrest Angelo and Gallion for the hit. In Gotti's case, he had bragged about the hit in the presence of a friend, who actually had been working for many months as an FBI informant. The NYPD eventually showed witnesses a photo of Gotti, and he was identified as one of the three men who killed McBratney. It would take about a year for Gotti's braggadocio to get him arrested in the McBratney homicide in June 1974. The key evidence was information given to the FBI and then the NYPD by the informant in Gotti's midst, known at the time by the codename Wahoo. Gotti, with the help of the politically connected celebrity attorney Roy Cohn, did post a $150,000 bail and promptly returned to the Bergen, where his crew continued its crimes, mainly hijacking with some loan sharking and other offenses thrown in. Although he had tested prison previously with the federal hijacking rap, Gotti really didn't want to spend much more time behind bars. With Cohn as his mouthpiece, Gotti and Angelo got a plea bargain with the Staten Island District Attorney's Office for attempted manslaughter in June 1975. The conviction charge meant a four-year prison sentence, 
which in reality would work out under the sentencing scheme to about two years, give or take. Both Gotti and Angelo surrendered and were sent to begin serving their time in Greenhaven Correctional Facility, less than 100 miles north of Howard Beach, a trip that was a relatively easy ride for their wives and children to make. Gotti and Angelo had taken one for the team, and under normal circumstances, that would have meant an easy jump to Mafia membership. But Carlo Gambino was at a point in his life, as boss, when he wasn't making new members. The books of the Mafia had been closed, and Gambino himself was wary of admitting too many people to membership. In fact, there had been stories that Gambino believed the five families had become too unwieldy, with too many young Turks who were hot-blooded and impulsive, a description that could at times fit Gotti. In the New York Times, veteran crime writer Nicholas Gage said in December 1972 that Gambino had even thought about expelling certain members who had shown weakness and vulnerability to being compromised by law enforcement. Gambino also had an aversion to drug dealing because he believed, correctly as it would turn out, that it invited too much scrutiny by federal law enforcement. In some ways, Gambino was ahead of his time in his thinking. He only had to look at the machinations of the Gotti Fatico crew. The Bergen Hunt and Fish outfit had been penetrated by at least one crucial informant and would see at least two or three more secretly work for the government. Gotti's bragging and pugnacious behavior were potential danger signs and sources of trouble as well. So Gambino kept the books closed to membership. And although he may have been grateful to Gotti for handling the McBratney matter, the old-timer kept his own counsel and refused to make new members. Gambino died of natural causes on October 15, 1976, at his home in Massapequa. His heart troubles and other ailments finally caught up to him, and after a relatively low-key funeral at Our Lady of Grace Church in Brooklyn, one surveilled by the FBI, NYPD, and other agencies, Don Carlo was interred in a crypt in the mausoleum at St. John's Cemetery. The immediate speculation was that Della Croce, the powerful family underboss, would take over from Gambino as boss. But Della Croce was in prison on a tax fraud case, and it appeared that prior to his death, Gambino decreed that he wanted his cousin, Paul Castellano, to succeed him. The higher-ups in the crime family agreed, and Castellano started running things. Gotti was in prison on the McBratney homicide when Gambino died, so he missed becoming a made member of the Mafia at the same time Angelo Ruggiero and Gene Gotti were given membership. But soon after Gotti was out of state prison in 1977, he got his button after Castellano opened up the books for new members. With Gambino gone, the Mafia Ruling Commission allowed the five families to expand its ranks. Life was good for Gotti now. He not only was the top dog at the Bergen Club, the Fatico brothers were doing time in federal prison for a hijacking charge, but his chief mentor, Della Croce, was now out of prison and was said to have been given a free hand by Castellano to run the Gotti Bergen crew as he saw fit. At the Bergen, Gotti was an acting captain someone with all the privileges and responsibilities of that rank, but without the official position. Of course, the drug ban was still very much in place under Castellano, at least as far as he was concerned. Yet there is evidence that Castellano was talking out of both sides of his mouth when it came to narcotics. He spouted the line that drug dealing among his made men was banned. But at some point, during the Pizza Connection investigation, which in 1984 unmasked the Sicilian heroin connection, Investigators, during a surveillance operation, spotted something they didn't expect to see. One day in October 1980, Castellano himself, the boss of the Gambino family, met at Martini's Seafood Restaurant in Bay Ridge with Salvatore Catalano and Giuseppe Ganci, two of the main actors in the heroin case. Also present was Castellano's driver and faithful acolyte, Tommy Bellotti. It was believed, although never proven in court, that Castellano had worked out a deal at that meeting to get a cut of the heroin profits for himself. Years later, Chief Prosecutor Richard Martin told the author that the government was never able to prove that Castellano took drug money from the Sicilians. Had that happened, Castellano would have likely been charged in the pizza connection. But two of the prosecution's main witnesses, undercover FBI agent Joseph Pistone and Italian criminal Luigi Roncisvalli, testified they were told that Catalano and his drug operation did have ties to the U.S. mafia families, he said. Pistone, added Martin, said that he learned through the mob that Carmine Galante was assassinated in 1979 because he wasn't sharing heroin money with the other families. Although ostensibly barred by Castellano from narcotics, the Bergen crew was still unofficially doing drug deals. 
even before Castellano came to power, Salvatore Ruggiero was involved in heroin, cocaine, and marijuana trafficking. Since he wasn't a member of the mob, Salvatore technically wasn't violating a mob rule by dealing in drugs. It was around this time that the FBI began to hear conflicting stories about Gotti's possible involvement in narcotics. One informant, known by the codename BQ, believed that Gotti was a major drug investor and alleged had some contact with Salvatore, who at this point in time was a fugitive. Where Gotti, who was a compulsive gambler, could have found the money to invest in narcotics was unclear. Another informant, known as Wahoo, who was in actuality Gotti's close associate, William Willie Boy Johnson, was skeptical that Gotti was involved at all in drugs, but kept open the prospect that the mobster might be investing. While Gotti may not have been directly dealing with narcotics himself, he must have known from his own street sense and the money people like Angelo Ruggiero were bringing in that drugs were in the picture. As would be shown a few years later in the Cedarhurst tapes, Angelo's own drug deals were widely known among mob associates across two or three mafia families. Gotti would have had his head in the sand not to know. Castellano was a boss cut from a different kind of cloth than Gotti. While Gotti's men were the working-class kids who roamed the streets in athletic shoes and casual dress, Castellano fancied himself the urban businessman who had built up a poultry and meat operation. His favorite style of dress was that of the custom-made business suit, which hung well-tailored on his six-foot, three-inch frame. His dark-rimmed spectacles gave him the bookish look of an actuarial. His distinctive nose was, as one writer described, vulturine, which was a term synonymous for rapacious or predator. Given his greedy ways, that seemed to be a fitting adjective. Castellano's wing of the family also had a significant presence in the then-lucrative garment industry, primarily through the trucking and dress companies of his nephew, Thomas Gambino, the son of Carlo. Both Thomas Gambino and his younger brother Joseph, who wasn't a member of organized crime, had built up a major garment trucking empire, which did tens of millions of dollars in business a year. Trucks were important to the industry, from moving finished product to the retailers and between manufacturers. Over the years, allegations would be leveled that the Gambino brothers were part of a cartel which controlled the garment trucking industry, allegations which would cost them dearly in the years ahead. Another Castellano ally was Joe Angallo, an elderly and diminutive gangster who would ultimately become consigliere of the crime family. It was through Gallo and others that organized crime controlled the Greater Blouse Association, a group of manufacturers on 7th Avenue. Three mob families, Gambino, Genovese, and Colombo, had divided power over the association and thus held sway over a significant swath of the garment industry in the city. Yet although he fancied himself above the blue-collar mobsters, Castellano had got his hands dirty over the years. He was believed to have controlled significant loan-sharking operations, in fact, around the time of Gambino's death, Castellano went on trial in Brooklyn Federal Court for loan sharking. But when a key government witness refused to testify, even when granted immunity, the case collapsed. In addition, a crew aligned with Castellano ran a homicidal car theft ring, led by killer Roy DeMeo, which sold stolen vehicles to the overseas market. DeMeo, who operated under Captain Nino Gaggi, was one of those men who seemed to relish killing, and the word on the street was that he was responsible for about 37 murders, or 100 depending on which account was given credence. One of his victims was said to have been Castellano's own son-in-law, Frank Amato, who was married to the mafia boss's daughter, Constance. When Castellano learned that Amato had been cheating on his daughter and abusing her as well, the errant spouse was not long for this world. Castellano told DeMeo to take care of Amato, and in September 1980 he disappeared. Castellano himself didn't participate in the car thefts, but instead got regular bundles of cash in the DeMeo gang, delivered to him at his large mansion on Toad Hill in Staten Island, dubbed the White House. As would be later described in a federal court trial, DeMeo killed those he suspected of being informants or competitors in the stolen car racket. To dispose of the bodies, DeMeo and his associates, often gangsters Tony Testa and Anthony Center, would take the victims and in a bathroom or the floor of a garage, dismember them, boxing the pieces for disposal in a garbage dump. One time, according to a witness, DeMeo was in such a frenzy in cutting up a body that an ear of the victim went flying around a garage, only to be found and eaten by the junkyard dog. However, at some point, DeMeo's bloodlust even made Castellano uncomfortable. 
The reason seemed to have been the increasing attention Manhattan federal prosecutors were paying to the activities of the stolen car ring. As a result, Castellano decided that De Mayo himself had to be eliminated, and for that he turned to Anthony Nino Gaggi. An FBI bug picked up Castellano telling Gaggi to take care of him, Nino. So in January 1983, De Mayo's body was found in the trunk of his abandoned car in Brooklyn. He had been shot several times in the head. Various stories later surfaced about how De Mayo was actually killed. One said he was having coffee with some of his crew members when he was dispatched. But the end result was the same. De Mayo, perhaps the most prolific and out-of-control killer in the mafia, was gone. While he fancied himself a businessman, Castellano didn't get to where he was by being meek. When it came time to contract out some hits, Castellano held his nose and agreed to a sit-down with the leaders of the Westies, the bad Irish gang on the west side of Manhattan. The Irishmen were a group of about two dozen gangsters and killers who sometimes kept the heads of their murder victims in freezers before getting around to disposing of them. They were successors to the tough tradition of mobsters like Mickey Spillane. Connected as he was to the politically connected McManus family, Spillane, not to be confused with the famous author, not only controlled gambling dens along 10th Avenue, but was a dispenser of jobs and other favors in the Irish community. In a sense, Spillane was the Gaelic equivalent of Carlo Gambino in his day, a man people came to see, much like Don Corleone in The Godfather. However, the Westies were a different breed than the Irish mob under Spillane. Led by James Coonan, the gang gained a reputation as killers and was suspected by the Gambino family of summarily dispatching a favorite mob loan shark, Charles Ruby Stein, at the time one of New York's most prolific loan sharks, with some of his millions in loans financing garment district businesses, Stein, in May 1977, was lured to a West Side Irish club, slain and dismembered. His remains later washed up on a Queen's beach. As distasteful as Castellano may have thought the Westies were, he agreed to a meeting with Coonan at Tommaso's Restaurant, a favorite Italian restaurant in Bay Ridge, next to Gambino Captain Jimmy Filo's Veterans and Friends Social Club. Castellano, accompanied by Della Croce, Joan Gallo, Nino Gacci, and some others, met Coonan and his chief lieutenant, Mickey Featherstone, to hammer out a deal in which it was agreed that the Irish would take hit contracts from the Gambino family. Although questioned about what happened to Lone Shark Stein, Coonan swore to Castellano he didn't know what had happened to him. Like most bosses of the period, Castellano sometimes hung his hat at a social club, and his particular favorite being the Veterans and Friends on 86th Street in Brooklyn, where Phila held sway. Phila, known as Jimmy Brown, was one of those older Gambino mobsters who was considered part of Castellano's white-collar apparatus. Phila had become an important captain under Gambino, and according to investigators, had been the old boss's key liaison between Gambino and Sam the Plumber Di Calvacante over the use of New Jersey garbage dumps. Phila's interest in the carding industry stemmed from his involvement, in one of that industry's major trade associations, the Association of Trade Waste Removers of Great New York. As in the garment trucking industry, the mob used certain trade waste associations as the basis for a cartel, controlling which company entered the market and where it could do business. There was another industry which Castellano had influence over, and that was construction. He and the bosses of the other crime families, excluding the Bonanno family, had set up the Concrete Club, a secretive arrangement, which squeezed concrete companies in New York City for payoffs. Working through Ralph Little Ralph Scopo of the Colombo family, the bosses extorted the payments, and in return, the companies were allocated contracts on building projects in the city of over $2 million. In return, the contractors kicked back 2% of their earnings to Scopo, who shared it with the four crime families. Some of the cash found its way to Castellano, who was raking in cash from other construction companies through his own captains. The avarice Castellano showed as the boss, forgetting for a moment his own legitimate businesses, soon began to build up resentment among some in the Gambino family, notably the Bergen crew. Castellano's imperious attitude had long been a sore point with Gotti and his crew. Loyal to Della Croce, the Bergen crew nevertheless continued to earn money through hijacking, loan sharking, and gambling, along with some drug dealing, and showed their value to Castellano. But although the Bergen crew did its job, None of them had any love for Castellano. Mafioso and the other crime families also couldn't help but notice Castellano's greed. He just couldn't get enough of the money. In one secret recording which surfaced years later, 
Duquesne gangster Sal Avellino recounted to his boss, Anthony Corallo, how Castellano whined about getting a reduced payoff from a labor union of $25,000. Down from the usual $200,000 cash, Castellano called a bone. Corallo could only express his disbelief and contempt. A bone? $2,000? Corallo asked rhetorically. Imagine that. He can't get enough. I don't understand this for the fucking hell of me. He didn't get enough. Imagine that. He didn't get enough money. Chapter 6. I could give you information. With Della Croce given a free hand to oversee Gotti's Bergen crew, Castellano had essentially ceded command of the Ozone Park gang to his seasoned underboss. The problem was, much as the late Gambino had feared, the younger generation which made up the Bergen club was undisciplined and reckless. The group was also riddled with informants. Among the worst of the lot was Gotti himself, who threw away money on gambling like the proverbial drunken sailor befriended people who were working secretly for the government and, it is believed, invested in drug deals to fund his compulsive gambling. A wanton Gotti's gambling was, has been described in Mustaine and Capisi's Mob Star as well as Davis's Mafia Dynasty. By January of 1981, Gotti seemed unable to catch a break with horse betting or football. One weekend, Gotti lost $21,000 on football, followed by another of $16,000. Mustaine and Capisi noted, adding that Gotti's forays to the local racetracks only added to his financial misery. Gotti also had a dice game in Manhattan's Chinatown, which did well, but even as owner, Gotti continued to lose even betting with house money. His losses became debilitating to the Chinatown dice game, and his brother Gene and Angelo were overheard talking about how it might be best to close the place down. We don't need him in the fucking game. Gene Gotti exclaimed when told of losses his brother sustained one night of $30,000. Yet Gotti's Bergen crew continued to do well in its other operations, mainly gambling, hijacking, and loan sharking, kicking up proceeds to Della Croce and Castellano. So long as the money flowed, the big bosses were happy. But no one realized how vulnerable the crew in Ozone Park had become to being penetrated by law enforcement. That was made clear by the way not only the FBI had developed informants, but also how even the Queen's District Attorney's Office had focused on the Bergen Clubhouse, putting in wiretaps and snaring a key informant. William Willie Boy Johnson was one of those men close to Gotti who, while unable to become a member of the Mafia because of his mixed ethnic background, his mother was American Indian, nevertheless had value to the Gambino family. Johnson was part of the Fulton Rockaway crew, and was described by one writer as sausage, stuffer by day, bookmaker by night, part-time boxer, and part American Indian. Johnson was tough and mean, just the kind of guy Gotti liked to have around. Johnson served as Gotti's driver, a fact that didn't go unnoticed to the local Queen's detectives. Remo Franciacini was one of the NYPD's premier investigators of the Mafia. Once wounded in a shootout and awarded the combat cross by the department, Francis Cheney had worked for a time in the Intelligence Division down on Hudson Street in Lower Manhattan, the unit which, among its many functions, kept tabs on organized crime figures around the city. When needed, his men would team up in special undercover cabs and prowl around the city, surveilling mobsters. One detective, Jack Clark, kept his own index card system of surveillance reports in a shoebox, a primitive system for sure, but one which would later provide critical leads to federal investigators in the Pizza Connection drug case. 1977, Francis Cheney moved over to Queens, where he commanded the detective squad of District Attorney John Santucci. Once a city councilman, Santucci was interim district attorney in December 1976 after his predecessor left for a judgeship. In November 1978, Santucci won the job outright in a follow-up election. Although the Queens District Attorney's Office had over the years been looked upon suspiciously by the FBI, there were rumors that the mob had inside sources of information about investigations there. The arrival of Francis Cheney changed things a bit. He got the squad to focus on Gotti's club at the Bergen, where they suspected crimes were being committed but didn't know what. The slim read of intelligence the Queen's investigators had about the Bergen was later described by Francis Cheney in his autobiography, A Matter of Honor, when he said that his investigators saw some of Gotti's men talking on a pay telephone by the door. We wanted to put a tap on the line, but you can't just go into a judge and say, Oh, I know there's crimes in there. You've got to have probable cause, Francis Cheney said. Had Queens had a good relationship with the FBI and an unsullied reputation in law enforcement, the office might have been able to approach the Bureau for help and much-needed intelligence. But the FBI was carefully keeping Johnson's role as their high-echelon informant secret, 
so Francis Cheney had to come up with evidence on his own to use against Johnson and Gotti. Once again, luck played a part in what happened next. One night in 1981, Johnson was spotted by two of Francis Cheney's detectives, meeting Arnold Squitieri, a known drug dealer, in a parking lot outside Kennedy Airport. As described in A Matter of Honor, the detectives noticed a car pull up and saw a black man take a package from Johnson and handed him a paper bag, which he placed in the trunk of his car. We had a pretty good suspicion that we just witnessed a drug deal going down, but of course we had no evidence, remembered Francis Cheney. The detectives followed Johnson to near his home, watched him take the paper bag out of the trunk and place its contents in an attache case, and then approached him. Startled, when the cops asked him what was in the case, Johnson blurted out, Oh, this is from my gambling operation, said Francis Cheney. Johnson apparently did have a gambling business on the side, but his admission put him in legal trouble. Come with us, the detectives told him as they handcuffed Johnson for the trip to Queens, along with $50,000 in cash. What happened next was something out of a grade B detective movie. Back in Francis Cheney's squad room, he let Johnson stew for a while, alternating between detectives who seemed friendly and those who played the bad cop routine. Johnson spoke up. Can we do some business? Johnson said to one of the detectives. What kind of business are we talking? The detective asked. Well, who's here? The lieutenant and I got you three guys. Uh, what about 8,000? To let me go, answered Johnson. One of the detectives then went and got Francis Cheney, who, when he entered the room, was offered the entire $50,000 by Johnson. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're under arrest. First of all, for trying to bribe my detectives, and now for trying to bribe me the 50000 Francis Cheney told Johnson. Panic hit Johnson. He was on probation, and if arrested again, would go back to jail. He played the one card left. He told Francis Cheney he could help him. I could give you information, said Johnson. But as Francis Cheney remembered things, working out a deal with Johnson was not so simple. If he was arrested and put through the court system, it would become quickly known that the cops had grabbed him, and his usefulness as an informant would be zero. There was also the question about what to do about his bribe attempt and the money the cops had seized. To avoid the regular NYPD channels, Francis Cheney worked out a plan with District Attorney Santucci in which, with the approval of a state prosecutor, the money was placed in the district attorney's safe and vouchered. Johnson indicted for the bribe attempt, but the indictment itself remained sealed with the court and thus unpublicized. In effect, Francis Cheney had a hold on Johnson. Meetings between Francis Cheney and Johnson sometimes took place by Maple Grove Cemetery in Kew Gardens, Queens, a short walk from the lieutenant's office. Johnson would be standing by a grave as if praying when Francis Cheney arrived. The detective carried a gun to these rendezvous because, after all, Johnson was a killer. Also surveilling the two men were other detectives from Francis Cheney's office. At other times, Johnson would call Francis Cheney in his office where the informant was known by the simple code name, The Girl. Over time, Johnson gave Francis Cheney a rundown on the way Gotti ran the crew at the Bergen and the various personalities. As the cops already knew, there was gambling inside the club. No surprise there. Johnson gave the investigator a fill-in on all of the characters close to Gotti. Some were useful, efficient gangsters. Others were not respected, said Johnson. Gene Gotti was described as a family man with a mean streak, constantly complaining about his brother John's gambling losses, while another brother, Richard Gotti, was pegged as a simple bookmaker who wouldn't really be anywhere if it had not been for his brother's stature. The eldest Gotti sibling was Peter, a city sanitation worker who was on disability for falling off a garbage truck and sometimes ran the Bergen if brothers John and Jean weren't around. Also part of the Bergen crew, related Johnson, were some names Francis Cheney didn't seem all too familiar with. Heroin-addicted Tony, Tony Roach Rampino, John Caneglia, an up-and-coming gangster, and attorney Michael Coro, whose claim to fame was that he knew a lot of judges and some prosecutors in Queens. But of all those at the Bergen, the one man Gotti seemed closest to was Angelo Ruggiero. Angelo was also someone Johnson had nothing much good to say about. Angelo Ruggiero, said Willie Boy, was a loudmouth, a cafone, slang for uncouth, always talking loud on the phone, always bitching, Francis Cheney would later remember. Ruggiero was a soldier, not a boss, although according to Willie Boy, he acted higher than his place. As Johnson talked more to Francis Cheney, he related Angelo's heavy involvement in heroin trafficking, just like his brother, who still was alive at this point, and on the lamb as Willie Boy talked to the lieutenant. 
Johnson pegged Angelo as running drugs with Gene Gotti and people like Arnold Squitieri. Although, as Franceschini noted, Willie Boy said nothing at all about that $50,000 cash he was caught with coming from drugs, as the investigators suspected. What about John Gotti? Was he involved in the drug deals? Other informants would say Gotti had invested in some drug halls, but Johnson wouldn't give up his boss. No, he said, John wasn't into drugs. He was emphatic about that. John Gotti had nothing to do with narcotics, noted Francis Cheney. Willie Boy was very protective of his boss. Of course, all of the information Willie Boy Johnson relayed to Francis Cheney wasn't enough to make any arrests, since it was basically uncorroborated. So in May 1981, Francis Cheney and the Queens District Attorney's Office received judicial authorization to wiretap the telephone in the Bergen. Undercover operatives, detectives, had made it a practice of hanging out by the Bergen and picked up snippets of conversations about bets being placed on the club's payphone, so that helped in getting the judicial order. As it turned out, Santucci's staff put two taps on two telephones in the Bergen and then planted a bug to pick up conversations in the club itself. For about a month, the surveillance picked up some evidence of gambling. But soon things got interesting for the Queen's District Attorney's Office, but not in the way Francis Cheney or Santucci would have expected, and they only had themselves and their staff to blame. On June 30, 1981, FBI agents and members of the NYPD Public Morals Unit raided the Bergen as part of a raid to seize illegal fireworks. Why the FBI would have an interest in fireworks is unclear, unless it is remembered that the agency was in the early stage of its probe of Angelo Ruggiero, John Gotti, and others. As the raid was underway, FBI agent Donald McCormick picked up the pay telephone inside the club and was told by club denizen Jack Cavallo, who actually ran the gambling operations, that the line was being tapped by Santucci's office. McCormick actually suspected the line was tapped, but wanted to place a call just to see what showed up. About a day later, McCormick's supervisor, Bruce Mao, got a call from someone working for Santucci to congratulate the FBI for the Bergen raid. While the FBI discovered the Santucci bug quite by chance, its existence created problems, not only for the Bureau, but also the Queen's prosecutor. Both agencies were in danger of stepping all over each other's investigation and screwing them up. On September 2nd, Mao and two of his immediate supervisors turned up at Santucci's office for a meeting with his staff, including Franceschini. At Santucci's suggestion, the group went to the Altadonna, a local Italian restaurant on Cross Bay Boulevard in Howard Beach, one well-known to mob characters. The confab was, to say the least, competitive, although Mao would later remember that the prosecutor was cordial and expressed a desire to work together with the FBI. Santucci said his electronic surveillance had been very successful, in obtaining gambling information, but had to admit had not found anything of value about loan sharking or homicides, two major crimes the Bergen crew was involved with. In fact, Santucci had to admit that taps on social clubs weren't that productive, and that electronic surveillance should be done on the homes of mobsters. Santucci was right that bugging residences of the mafiosi could provide good evidence, but he was wrong about the social clubs being dry holes, as the FBI would find out in its various operations and mafia clubs around the city, which turned up some useful tapes. In any case, Santucci agreed to back off his effort on the Bergen and let the FBI take the lead in that area. Mao, who grew up in Iowa and hadn't much dealings with city prosecutors who came out of the political world as Santucci did, remembered feeling uncomfortable in dealing with the district attorney, although there was nothing he could put his finger on as the source of his discomfort. About ten days later, Mao and Santucci's staff met again to talk about surveillance of Gotti and his crew. But as Mao would remember it, Santucci's people indicated they believed they could have a possible leak in their office and wanted the FBI's help in uncovering those who might be responsible. While it was no secret that Coro claimed to have a hook in the local prosecutor's office and that others, like infamous Lufthansa heist mastermind Jimmy Burke, had very good sources there, the problem might actually have been an embarrassing slip-up with Santucci's own staff. It seems that Santucci's office had failed to put the notation Do Not Notify on its subpoena to the telephone company when records of the Bergen telephone were requested. Without that notice, the telephone provider was free to, and apparently did, tell the Bergen at some point that its telephone records had been requested by Santucci. So when Cavallo told Agent McCormick that the telephone in the club was tapped, well, he had it on the best of authority. A few years later, Santucci was further embarrassed when it was revealed in the newspapers that he had had a long lunch, by some estimates as long as 14 hours, with an up-and-coming NYPD inspector, 
a reputed Gambino associate named Sariale, and several political operatives at the Altadana. In the saga of the Gotti era, Santucci's efforts were noteworthy, but in the end they turned out to be small beer. The mishandling of the subpoena was an embarrassment. In June 1982, Santucci's people and the NYPD raided Gotti's gambling operation on Mott Street in Chinatown. Neither Gotti nor Ruggiero and the other big men of the Bergen happened to be present when the detectives rolled through the door. But the cops seized $100,000 in proceeds, gambling paraphernalia, and made seven arrests, among them Anthony Rapino, William Batista, Peter Tambone, and Frank DeChico. The defendants appeared in court a day or two later, with Coro acting as their lawyer, pled guilty to misdemeanor gambling charges, and were fined $500. But it also appeared that the court papers indicated that there had been an informant involved in tipping off police about the gambling operation. If Gotti didn't realize before that his operation had been penetrated, he knew it now. The Santucci screw-up with the subpoena wasn't the only thing which compromised law enforcement focus on Gotti, Ruggiero, and the rest of the Bergen crew. The FBI offices in Queens were in Rigo Park, a busy commercial and residential neighborhood in which Queens Boulevard was the spine which ran down its center. Mao and his agents worked from a suite of offices and availed themselves of the various bars and restaurants in the area. Sometime in June or July of 1982, one of Mao's agents stopped by the Test Teresa's and stayed for a while. The problem was that upon leaving, the agent left behind a folder which contained documents which happened to be the affidavit for the surveillance being done on Angela Ruggiero. The material was a basic roadmap of the government's investigation, laying out what they suspected Ruggiero of doing and who was believed to be doing it with him. The stuff somehow got into the hands of Anthony Moscatello, a Gambino associate of Gotti's. From there, it got back to Ruggiero. The FBI learned that Ruggiero was also on to the agency surveillance as spelled out in the affidavit from a confidential informant. Ruggiero said that a big guy in another crew of the Gambino family had told him that a federal judge in Brooklyn, it was Judge Henry Bramwell, had signed the surveillance order. As Ruggiero learned, Bramwell had reviewed information provided to him by the FBI from five informants to place three bugs in his Cedarhurst house. Ruggiero also found out that it wasn't just him who was targeted, but also Gene Gotti, Edward Lino, John Coneglia, and Robert DiBernardo, a Gambino captain who had made his work in the pornography industry. Chapter 7. You are pissing some big people off. It was in late March 1982, some three months before Ruggiero even saw the FBI's surveillance affidavit, that he suspected he might be the object of government spying. His unsuspecting wife had let in some men who claimed to be telephone workers into the Cedarhurst house. They did their work in looking for the source of a neighborhood power problem and left. Both Ruggiero and Cora were suspicious, and sure enough, after checking around, they discovered the men weren't real telephone company employees at all. No one was really sure who they were, but Cora suspected they were FBI agents in disguise as repairmen and installing taps on the telephones and bugging the house. Made men, if they had any sense, would always be surveillance conscious, watching for strange cars and looking in their rearview mirrors for tails. But electronic devices were beyond their ability to do anything about. In frustration, some of the regulars at a mob social club once tore down a parabolic antenna, thinking it might be spied upon by the FBI. Once at a banana social club, a glitch in a bug transmitted conversations and flushing toilet noises to a nearby AM radio leading to the discovery and dismantling of the devices. However, to counter the surveillance capabilities that government could amass against them, mobsters had to call in some experts. And in New York City, with the largest police force in the country, there were always retired cops willing to help out. John McNally had worked as a special investigations unit detective and attained the rank of first grade, the highest. After retiring, McNally, like many who left the force, became a private investigator. In a city like New York, with some of the greatest number of attorneys working in all sorts of fields, investigators, good ones anyway with connections to law enforcement, didn't have much trouble finding work. Civil lawyers needed them for divorces, workers' compensation claims, and accident investigations. On the criminal side, investigators were the ones to dig into the background of prosecution witnesses and seek out witnesses to help the defense. So when Coro needed an investigator on some of his cases, he had run across McNally and occasionally used him. 
With Coro suspecting Ruggiero's place to be bugged, he turned to McNally to perform an electronic sweep of the Cedarhurst house for the presence of electronic monitoring devices. Electronic sweeping is a specialty, which requires the right equipment and a person who knows how to handle it. McNally hadn't really specialized in sweeping, but as chance would have it, had a few months earlier reconnected with an old NYPD friend who was versed in that kind of work. John Conroy was a 53-year-old retired first-grade detective who had landed a job as manager of security for Philip Morris, Inc. Sadly, McNally had recently lost his 20-year-old son in a car accident. Conroy came to the funeral to console his old colleague. As they chatted, Conroy let it be known that he needed extra money. Would McNally help him earn some extra money moonlighting, Conroy asked. As it turned out, Conroy had recently acquired some experience in debugging technology from working at both Merrill Lynch and Philip Morris. For McNally, that was the right connection at the right time, since he often had to do electronic sweeps for clients. Both ex-cops struck a deal. McNally would give Conroy assignments to do sweeps in return for one-third of the fee the client paid. Over a three-month period in early 1982, Conroy got three assignments from McNally. Two of them involved sweeping the homes and offices of private executives, while the other involved a social club on Long Island. The payments were all in cash, and Conroy used his own equipment, as well as some from Philip Morris. When the time came in April to sweep Ruggiero's house, Conroy called and arranged a date for April 17, 1982, a Saturday. As astute as Conroy and Ruggiero tried to be in arranging the sweep, the FBI was on to the plan because the bugs already operating in the house were picking up their conversations. So when it came time for Conroy to do his sweep for bugs, the FBI agents simply deactivated them for a day. Conroy showed up on schedule and checked the house out on all three floors. There were no bugs in the house, Conroy told Ruggiero. But he added the telephones were indeed tapped, except for the princess phone in his daughter's room, which Ruggiero had been using for many of his calls. Conroy would later explain his finding by telling Ruggiero that while testing his telephone lines, they produced a higher-than-normal energy output, a sign he believed that the lines were tapped. With his paranoia confirmed, Ruggiero asked Conroy to sweep his cars for bugs, but those also turned up negative. With advance warning, the FBI had masked the house bugs by deactivating them. After Conroy left, they could be turned back on. But Conroy, for reasons which are unclear, missed the tap on the princess phone the one which Ruggiero used most. Nevertheless, Ruggiero was convinced of Conroy's abilities. He asked him to perform sweeps at his friend's home and at the Lucchese Crime Family Club, the 19th Hole in Brooklyn. Ruggiero also asked Conroy if he had any contacts which could confirm if the taps were legal and which agency had placed them. Sure, said Conroy. He had a contact at the telephone company. Angela raised six children of his own and at this point was ready to take care of his brother Salvatore's children should the need arise as it would. As family-oriented as this was for a heroin trafficker, Angelo had a number of personality faults. One of them is that he could be played like a fiddle by anyone who saw a vulnerability with him. In the case of Conroy, the ex-cop knew that Angelo didn't have the sophisticated understanding of how electronic surveillance worked. He thought Angelo was kind of stupid. As a man in need of money, Conroy saw how he could manipulate Angelo by giving him what he wanted, knowledge of government surveillance. Conroy had no inside sources of information in the telephone company, but Angelo didn't know that, so when the ex-cop offered to find out if the Cedarhurst telephone lines were tapped, he jumped at the chance. The deal was that Angelo would pay Conroy $1,000. $800 was to go to the Phantom Telephone Company employee, and the rest was ostensibly Conroy and McNally's finder's fees for $100 each. So on April 24, 1982, Conroy told Angelo that, indeed, his telephones were tapped, legally tapped, as he put it, pursuant to a court order signed by a federal judge in Manhattan. Angelo asked if Conroy's contact had a copy of the affidavit used to get the court order, but he made up a story that he doesn't receive them to initiate a tap. Angelo thought he had a good thing going with Conroy and his supposed connections. The information that Conroy related about the Manhattan Federal Court wiretap authorization seemed to confirm Angelo's earlier suspicions, that he was being watched by the FBI because of his secret contacts with both his brother Salvatore and Joseph Messino, both men who were fugitives. As far as Conroy was concerned, he knew he had a good thing with Angelo. The Gambino mobster was so anxious about his situation, 
so unsophisticated and so impulsive that he was willing to pay whatever Conroy asked to find out information. Thousands of dollars were also paid to Conroy to check the home telephones of John and Jean Gotti, as well as John Corneglia. He even asked for more electronic sweeps to be done. Conroy was only too happy to comply. He had found a cash cow in Angelo and was going to milk him for all he could in this secret little scam. Conroy played along with the scheme, dangerous as it was. He was conning one of the toughest street crews in the Gambino family, all for his own greed. Ruggiero did get something for his money. He was able to warn the other crew members and associates that there were taps on his home phone so that they could take precautions. Their telephone conversations were more circumspect, and Angelo often arranged to have people call him at public telephones at prearranged times. Into May of 1982, Conroy continued with his charade. At one point, he told Angelo and a group of mobsters, including Victor Musso, a top captain in the Lucchese crime family, that the mob social club, the 19th Hole, did have taps on its lines but no bugs. Conroy embellished things further by saying down the street from the club he had found a parabolic microphone device installed on the roof of a building about two blocks away from the bar. The device, Conroy explained, had the ability to pick up conversations inside the bar. Angelo and the other mobsters were fascinated over Conroy's discovery, and no questions asked paid the ex-detective more money on the spot. Angelo thought Conroy was something of a genius, a man with connections who could be very valuable. Since Salvatore Ruggiero had died in the plane crash, Angelo had been on a search for his assets. Could Conroy help find Salvatore's safe deposit boxes in New Jersey banks? Conroy said he could, but that it would cost. To get the ball rolling, Angelo gave Conroy two aliases his brother had used, Sal Capizano and Terry Diasato. Conroy said he would check with his contacts, figuring that he could keep this little scheme going against the unwitting Angelo. Angelo even admitted to Conroy that he feared the FBI could cook up any charge it wanted to against him, but that narcotics wasn't his game. Jack, they could accuse me of a lot of things, and I'll probably say it happened, Angelo said in a moment when he opened up to Conroy at the gangster's home. You know, my game in numbers, my game in shylocking, bookmaking, hey, I'll even shake down a guy for $50,000, I'll do it. They start that narcotics, scoffed Ruggiero. I got six kids. Then on July 7, 1982... Everything started to unravel when the FBI raided Angelo's house, gave Coro search warrant materials, and then removed the bug from the downstairs living area, the bug which Conroy had assured everyone didn't exist. To make matters worse, Coro read in the search warrant affidavit information that listed Conroy's name as having once done work for the Federal Organized Crime Strike Force. To Coro and Angelo, this was distressing information to learn on top of the FBI raid. Both men immediately suspected incorrectly as it turned out, that Conroy might have actually planted the bug in the Cedarhurst house himself, working as a kind of double agent for the government. Two days after the raid, the FBI did pay Conroy a visit, and agents gave him a rundown of everything he had done for Angelo. At that point, Conroy knew the government had a line on him and could cause him a great deal of trouble. For an old cop, Conroy knew he had few options. He agreed to cooperate and even wear a tape recorder to catch Coro and McNally making incriminating statements. But Conroy felt a strange loyalty to McNally and agreed to meet him in secret, without telling the FBI and without wearing a recorder. In one meeting, McNally told Conroy that Coro had read about his previous work for the strike force and that after the bug was removed from Ruggiero's house, the mobster suspected he had planted it. You better be concerned for your safety, McNally warned Conroy. McNally also started a sweat because Conroy told him that he had given up everything to the FBI, the sweeps, the debugging, the bogus telephone company contacts. Fearing the worst and trying to backpedal, McNally said he only did legitimate investigative work, even if it was for gangsters. With the July raid, the FBI search warrant affidavits, and all of the things Conroy had been feeding him, Angela knew that he was a choice target for the feds. He was becoming increasingly paranoid and concerned with good reason. With the bug found in his house, Angelo knew that for a period of months before his brother Salvatore died, and right through the time he did some major heroin deals himself, that the FBI had likely listened to his most conspiratorial conversations. He still thought he was being looked at for talking with the fugitive Messino, but the drug situation was much worse. One FBI informant inside the Bergen told agents that Ruggiero was sweating bullets about an imminent arrest. In Mobstar, who stand in Capisi, related a memo put in FBI files which summarized what the informant or source said about Ruggiero's predicament. 
Soros advised Angelo Ruggiero is scared to death because he had been lying systematically to Big Paul and Neil De La Croce insofar as he constantly told them he is not dealing in drugs by himself, but merely cleaning up loose ends of his brother's narcotics operation. If they learn he was lying, it is quite likely that Angelo might be hit. Angelo and Gotti laid low in the summer of 1982. They avoided the Bergen, which was in the hands of Gotti's brothers, Gene and Peter, for day-to-day -day operations. But Ruggiero, if he feared the FBI and his Gambino bosses, couldn't stay away from the heroin racket. With the FBI breathing down his neck, Ruggiero nevertheless, on August 4, 1982, checked into the Sheraton Hotel in Smithtown, Long Island, under the name of Sal Scala, a Gambino soldier. Ruggiero would stay at the hotel for almost two weeks, his comings and goings being watched by FBI surveillance agents. Angelo met not only with Scala, but with Gambino associate Anthony Moscatello, who brought him $200,000 in cash, according to the FBI. He then met on that same day, August 13th, with John Carneglia, Mark Ryder, and others in the Whisper Lounge, a site with an ironic name, given that the FBI seemed to have enough agents in the area to get a sense that something no good was going on. That seemed obvious when early the next morning, Muscatello exchanged envelopes with Ryder and then, in Carneglia's direction, retrieved the $200,000 and brought it to Ruggiero's hotel room. Within minutes of the cash exchange, Carneglia drove home, followed by FBI agents, who saw him retrieve a duffel bag from his car and bring it into his house in Howard Beach. It all meant, the FBI said, that a major heroin deal had gone down, even in the face of a major investigation. Ruggiero and the rest of the group were being nothing, if not reckless. The long FBI look into Angelo Ruggiero and the Bergen crew was leading to more than just the heroin deals. The bugs in the Cedarhurst house, combined with informants and surveillance at the club, showed that Paul Castellano was himself involved in criminal activity and directing the crime family. But Big Paul was circumspect. He didn't dare visit the Hoi Polloi clubs like the Bergen or the Ravenite in Manhattan, rarely going to places like the Veterans and Friends Club in Brooklyn, which, practically speaking, was not far from his White House estate on Toad Hill. FBI agent Joe O'Brien knew Toad Hill well. A maverick of sorts, O'Brien was part of the C-16 squad, put together by Bruce Mao, which targeted the Gambino crime family. Other agents had focused on Queens and places like the Bergen Club, while O'Brien spent some of his time on Staten Island. The decision had been made that the top bosses in the crime families were to be targeted, and for that, the FBI squads did the usual surveillance activity. This was all part of Mao's game plan. Get the agents out into the street to troll the areas where the gangsters live and work. Make connections, dig for information. In the case of O'Brien, he started working Sundays to try and find out who was meeting Castellano on Staten Island and taking the license plate numbers of cars which visited the boss's Toad Hill estate. As innocuous as some of the surveillance may have seemed, it got O'Brien into some tense situations, particularly with Thomas Bellotti, the man who was Castellano's driver. It seemed that Bellotti didn't like O'Brien snooping around Staten Island, but also the agent's ploy of sending the wise guys cards on their birthdays and such. One Sunday, as O'Brien was tailing Bellotti, the gangster had enough. He pulled up next to O'Brien's car and started screaming, You and your fucking greeting card, you think you are funny? An apoplectic, Bellotti yelled, You are pissing some big people off. Unfazed, O'Brien said that Castellano wouldn't approve of Bellotti's tirade, since the boss tried to treat the agents with respect. To goad Bellotti even further, O'Brien quipped that some of the gangsters referred to him by the moniker The Wig, a reference to the obvious hairpiece Bellotti liked to wear. At that point, a further enraged Bellotti motioned with his arm in a gesture, which O'Brien indicated that he was reaching for a baseball bat kept under his seat. Concerned that he was alone in enemy territory and about to get into a serious physical confrontation, O'Brien pulled out his service handgun. Seeing the piece, Bellotti sped away. In terms of Castellano, it became obvious that more than just a telephone tap would be needed to get the goods on him. A tap had, in fact, been authorized, but it had been unproductive since Castellano was circumspect about what he talked about on the telephone. Mao decided that just as they had done with Angelo Ruggiero, the FBI needed a bug in Castellano's house. An informant, later unmasked as businessman Jules Mirren, told investigators that Castellano did a great deal of his business at home, in a dining alcove by the kitchen. Miran even drew agents a diagram of the setup. With the information Mao's agents had collected through surveillance of the garrulous Ruggiero and the Bergen Club, 
there was more than enough evidence for prosecutors to compile an affidavit for a warrant to authorize bugging the Castellano home. The real challenge would be finding a way to enter the mansion after having neutralized any alarms and security systems, plant the bug, and then get out, all without being caught. Physically, the house made it difficult to penetrate. There was a tall metal fence surrounding it, and Castellano had two big doorman pinchers prowling the property. To case out the location, Joe O'Brien and another agent, Wally Ticano, knocked on the door of the Castellano home to serve a subpoena. They were greeted by Castellano's wife, Nina, and his daughter, Connie, who let the agents come in and use a telephone to call the crime boss's attorney, James LaRosa. This was in the era before cell phones, and the family extended the courtesy of the call, not realizing that as O'Brien entered the kitchen to use the telephone, that he carefully glanced around and noticed the dinette area with a high back chair, which he assumed was where Castellano sat. Marin confirmed that guess in his talks with agents. The crucial day in the bugging operation was March 17, 1983. Castellano, his maid and paramour, Gloria Orlarte, as well as Tommy Bellotti, had to camp to the boss's condominium in Pompano Beach, Florida. The only person left in the house was Castellano's wife, Nina. What happened next in the FBI operation was a masterpiece of planning, bravado, and luck, all of which was later described in the book Boss of Bosses, penned by O'Brien and fellow agent Anders Currens. The first issue was the fierce Dobermans patrolling the property, and for that, two agents, puttering outside the fence, tossed two sirloin steaks laced with animal tranquilizers to put the canines into a sleep, which would last about six hours. As expected, the animals started to snooze, and the FBI break-in team began its business at about 1.30 a.m. the next morning. As described in O'Brien and Curran's book, two FBI agents had the assignment to break into the mansion, but there were teams of other agents posing as sanitation men in a truck to block a key road leading to the mansion should the alarm be tripped and the special security team Castellano hired to watch his systems try to drive up to the mansion. They had a plan for everything. The penetration agents, the ones doing the break-in, even carried tranquilizer darts in case the dogs awoke from their slumber. Another FBI car was in the area to watch the house in case lights suddenly came on inside. On a signal from O'Brien and Currens, the team of three FBI technical experts, the morning of the break-in, parked about a half block from the mansion, and dressed in black, walked to the garage after scaling the fence. The lock to the garage was picked, and the agents found themselves among four Castellano vehicles, including a Jaguar and a Mercedes, as well as the two sleeping Dobermans. As Currens remembered it, he gave one of the dogs a slight nudge with his foot, just to make sure they were in deep slumber. They were. Using a special digital device, the Black Bag Squad deactivated the Castellano alarm system and entered the living area by picking another lock. At the kitchen, Currens and O'Brien said they made a beeline towards the dinette area. There, O'Brien took apart a lamp to Castellano's favorite chair, installed an omnidirectional microphone and a power pack, then reassembled everything, with Currens putting the lamp back in its proper place. To simplify the job, O'Brien simply substituted a new lamp base for the old one, putting the old piece of equipment in a sack he carried. Currens made sure the lamp was put right back where it had been. The agents cleaned up any stray debris, turned the alarm system back on, and left through the doors they had picked. As O'Brien and Currens remembered the entire job took about twelve and a half minutes, the agents walked to their vehicle and drove away. The story as described in Boss of Bosses of the bugging of Castellano's mansion is a marvelous cloak-and-dagger episode. Simply marvelous, gripping. Everything sounded like it went off like clockwork. The two men must have had nerves of steel to pull it off. At least that is what it sounded like. The problem is that, at least as far as Kearns and O'Brien's activities that night were concerned, it wasn't true. As former supervisory FBI agent Bruce Mao, as well as FBI official James Kallstrom later revealed publicly, the two agents did not and would not have done the break-in. The complex, risky job was done, according to the two officials, by a highly trained FBI technical team, supervised by Kallstrom. The episode described in Boss of Bosses appears to have been done to juice up the narrative. But what was true was that to monitor the bug, O'Brien and Currens had selected a location not far from the mansion and soon began harvesting the fruits of the surveillance, which turned out to be bountiful. The location of the monitoring room was in a Victorian house at 1510 Richmond Road, which the FBI rented for $1,000 a month. It provided for a good vantage point from which to monitor the bug and get a sense of who was visiting the Castellano mansion. 
Years later, the two agents recalled in Boss of Bosses how they anguished for hours as they waited to see if the bug worked. They needed to pick up any sound to make sure the device had been activated and would do the job. Failure would jeopardize the entire investigation. Their answer came in the form of Nina Castellano, the Don's wife, who early that morning was overheard talking to the drowsy dogs, unaware they had been drugged. You're sleepy this morning. Don't even want to go outside, said Nina. Look at you, so lazy. As O'Brien and Currens remembered it, those inconsequential mutterings of the old woman was music to their ears. The bug was up and running. For over four months, the device picked up 600 hours of relevant conversations from the mansion. It was another thing Castellano could thank the Bergen crew for, as well as his own neglect of his job as their boss. The bugging and taping would have gone on for longer, but at some point in August 1983, it malfunctioned and died, giving back nothing but silence. Still, the material it had provided continued to feed the investigation for many months. Chapter 8 the junk crowd. As 1982 came to a close, Angelo Ruggiero knew that things were getting precarious. The FBI had collected tons of information from the bug in his house. Surveillance teams were all over him and the Bergen Club. His mentor and close friend John Gotti may have been running things at the club, but he was proving to be a distracted boss. Gotti was burning through tons of cash with his compulsive gambling and had problems of his own. Around Christmas time, when Alfred Delantash, the drug dealer and sometimes aircraft operator, went to visit him in Cedarhurst, Ruggiero walked outside with him and complained about all of the drug heat he was feeling. Delantash may have been a close friend of Angelo's brother Salvatore, but he wasn't above being a bit duplicitous when it came to their drug activities. Just before Salvatore died, in the May 1982 plane crash, he had given Delantash and his partner, Wayne DeBaney about 1.5 kilos of heroin in a suitcase to hold for safekeeping in return for a fee of $2,500. DeBaney actually later recalled that he never even opened the suitcase until after Salvatore died and discovered five envelopes filled with the heroin. But instead of turning it over to Angelo, Delantash and DeBaney kept the narcotics in Westchester County, turning down an offer of $450,000 for the batch. The heroin held by Delantash and DeBaney had value beyond just what it could get them on the street. In January 1983, both men were in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to work on a deal for 55 kilos of cocaine, or about 120 pounds. The sellers agreed to take $120,000 in collateral and to hold about one kilo of heroin, which had been part of Salvatore Ruggiero's suitcase stash. Once the full payment was made for the cocaine, Delantash and DeBaney were to get the heroin back. The night of January 24, 1983, Delantash and DeBaney turned over the heroin and the cash deposit to the sellers and expected to take custody of the cocaine. Instead, both were immediately arrested by Louisiana state troopers. The purported sellers had been undercover officers. Delantash and DeBaney had found themselves in a great deal of trouble, facing decades in a state prison. To the rescue, sort of, came the federal government and Louisiana officials. The feds already had intelligence and a line on Delantash through the investigation of the Bergen crew. Knew he had been in close contact with Angelo and had a lot of information about the heroin ring. The proposal was simple. Help the big investigation in New York, and prosecutors would ask the judge to give some consideration to Delantash when he came up for sentencing. So in April 1983, Delantash entered into an agreement with the Brooklyn Organized Crime Strike Force and their federal counterparts in Louisiana to cooperate. As an initial showing of good faith, Delantash told the prosecutors where they could find the additional heroin, which had been part of Salvatore Ruggiero's little suitcase stash. Back in Westchester, one of Delantash's relatives took agents to an underground safe where the heroin had been kept. The heroin taken from the ground in Westchester was tested and found to have been manufactured in Pakistan the same as had been discovered about the heroin seized on Delantash in the Louisiana arrest. Agents thought it was likely that the samples may have been processed at the same Pakistani laboratory. Delantash was a good catch for the prosecutors. He could provide key information about some meetings which took place at Angelo's homes in Howard Beach and Cedarhurst at times when the bugging device wasn't available. He could list the participants, the essence of their conversations, and if necessary, make identifications of voices heard on recordings. Even with Delantash and DeBaney on the side of the government, prosecutors still had a great deal of work to do to make a case against Angelo 
and to see how close they could get to the Gotti clan, including John Gotti. There are hundreds of hours of tape recordings to analyze and tons of documents to scrutinize, as well as to see how well it might all dovetail with what Delantash and Debeney could provide. This was going to be a monster prosecution. About three months after Delantash decided to cooperate, Brooklyn prosecutors finally put together a battle plan. In a prosecution memorandum sent to their superiors in Washington that government attorneys, Laura Brevetti and Norman Block, painstakingly sketched out who the potential defendants might be and what charges they could face with the evidence in hand. The prosecutors also had to consider the defenses Angelo and the others might raise, as well as a potential problem presented by a government screw-up in sealing some of the recordings involved in Bonanno Captain Joseph Messino. Aside from Angelo, the prosecutors had their eyes on indicting 12 other defendants. Gene Gotti, John Corneglia, attorney Michael Coro, Joseph Guagliano, Anthony Muscatello, Oscar Ensorian, Edward Lino, Mark Ryder, William Sestaro, Salvatore Greco, Salvatore Scala, and the Canadian gangster and heroin trafficker Gerlando Sasha. Conspicuously absent from the group was John Gotti himself. The indictment being drafted comprised 11 counts, the core of which centered around the narcotics operation. Angelo was to be a central figure in the case, as were Gene Gotti and John Corneglia. The government figured it had enough to charge them with racketeering conspiracy, products conspiracy, and obstruction of justice. The main conspiracy seemed to extend from November 1981, when Angelo was first called before a Manhattan federal grand jury looking into the mob, through August 1983 when he was involved in the Long Island heroin deal. The activity after Salvatore Ruggiero's death in May 1982, the pressure being put on his in-laws not to cooperate with the government or give false information, would be the basis for the obstruction of justice charges. Angelo's payments to ex-cops John Conley and John McNally to find out about sealed court orders on surveillance were to be the basis of the obstruction of justice charges, as was the activity of several others to hide Salvatore's assets after his death. Angelo, Gotti, and Carneglia would likely be charged in all of the counts, but many of the others would face less exposure. For instance, Mark Ryder would only be charged with the heroin trafficking, as would Scala, Shasha, and some of the others. Michael Coro would have his fair share of problems in the case and was to be charged with obstruction of justice through witness intimidation and hiding Salvatore's assets. The case wasn't without its potential problems. In their battle plan, the prosecutors noted as a general rule FBI agents monitoring the bugs in Angelo's house had a duty to minimize the amount of innocuous or non-pertinent conversations they recorded. Sometimes it was easy to discern what might be relevant, such as when Angelo was talking to his wife Marie or their children about mundane family matters. But other times, when Angelo was talking about things in a cryptic way, it was more difficult for the agency to decide. Sometimes, to err on the side of caution, agents didn't listen to some conversations, which may have actually been relevant because they couldn't identify those talking. But in the end, the prosecutors thought that the issue of minimization was in their favor. Another problem arose from Coro's status as an attorney for Ruggiero. Normally, attorney conversations with the client were off-limits on surveillance if they were about legal issues and representation, as well as spoken in confidence. But Coro sometimes spoke with Ruggiero in the presence of others, including Salvatore's in-laws, and in those cases their talks weren't protected by the privilege. A critical conversation in which Ruggiero, in the presence of others, told Coro, you are one of us, was not only outside the privilege but pretty damning. Another problem for Coro was that his conversations, particularly about hiding Salvatore's assets, involved criminal conduct and also not protected. With so many taped conversations of Coro about committing crimes, it seemed to the prosecutors that they could use them against him with impunity. There was another issue about the tapes which was more serious for the prosecution and which could lead to some problems. Surveillance tapes have to be sealed, and if there is any delay in doing that after the recordings end, the courts sometimes bar prosecutors from using them. As far as Angelo's tapes were concerned, there was one troubling 42-day delay in sealing some of the recordings, and that the prosecutors readily acknowledged could lead to some of the tapes being suppressed by the court. But even if that were so, those tapes were found to mostly relate to Ruggiero talking with then-fugitive Joseph Messino, and weren't seen as crucial. Witnesses Alfred Delantash, Wayne DeBaney, and others had their own particular baggage, and that they readily admitted committing crimes— 
and their motives for cooperating with the government might be viewed with suspicion by a jury. Salvatore Ruggiero's in-laws might also be uncooperative on the witness stand. But prosecutors believed that their recalcitrance would be attributed by the jurors to their fear of Angelo. However, there were some pretty good tape recordings which could be used to work around those problems. Prosecutors expressed confidence. Simply put, the tape recordings alone make this a good case, the prosecution team said in its memo to Washington. The tape recordings plus the testimony of the civilian witnesses make this a powerful and conclusive case. The prosecution memo was dated July 8, 1983. If arrests were authorized, any subsequent trial was expected to take about six weeks. Shortly thereafter, the indictment plan was approved. For the Gotti boys, the future was going to become unsettled very quickly. For the New York Mafia, things were going to get even worse. The Bergen crew was bracing for some kind of indictment. Nobody knew exactly what would be in the charges, but Angelo is said to have acted nonplussed, reportedly spending $40,000 to renovate the Cedarhurst house and scoffing at the notion of an indictment. John Gotti was sweating because he knew he had been the object of surveillance as well. Lawyer Michael Coro, for whom an indictment would be a tremendous fall from grace, was said to be drinking more than usual. The suspense finally lifted on August 23, 1983. Teams of FBI agents fanned out around New York and Long Island and arrested eight people at their homes. Angela Ruggiero, Michael Coro, Jean Gotti, John Corneglia, Joseph Guagliano, Anthony Muscatello, Mark Ryder, Salvatore Scala. A total of 13 people were actually charged, but five, Edward Lino, Gerlando Sasha, William Robert Sestero, Oscar Ansorian, and Salvatore Greco, weren't found by the agents and were considered fugitives. They would all eventually be arrested. The group was charged under a federal criminal complaint, a prelude to a later indictment, and accused of smuggling hundreds of pounds of 98% pure heroin from Southeast Asia. In court, Assistant U.S. Attorney Norman Block said the crew purchased its heroin from wholesalers in Florida for $150,000 a kilo and sold it back in New York on the wholesale market for $200,000. Block told Federal Magistrate Shira Shinlin that the FBI made the case through hundreds of hours of conversations picked up on bugs in Angelo's house in Cedarhurst. This is the beginning and not the end of what the government plans to prove, Block told Shinlin. The FBI was a bit coy in tying the case to organized crime, Thomas Shear, the special agent in charge of the FBI office in New York, said the men were part of a number of mafia families but didn't identify which. But anybody plugged into the intelligence networks knew that the Gambino and Bonanno families were among those targeted. As soon as the arrests went down, Castellano and Gotti knew they had problems, although for different reasons. Castellano now realized that the autonomy he had given Della Croce to supervise the Bergen crew had been a strategic mistake. Despite the drug ban, Gotti's crew had become major suspects in a massive heroin operation. As boss of the crime family, Castellano knew that he was at risk for being ensnared in the case if it could be shown that any of the money Della Croce and Gotti's crew kicked up to him had come from narcotics, something that would make him part of the charged conspiracy. In Gotti's case, the charges showed that either he knew what was going on or that he was a crew leader who couldn't follow Castellano's edict against drugs. Either way, Gotti was to be viewed with suspicion by Castellano, who could, if he wanted, to summarily break up the Bergen crew or have some of them killed. John Gotti is on the carpet with Big Paul Castellano over the drug bust, one FBI wrote in a report after debriefing informant Willie Boy Johnson. Paul feels that either John was involved himself, and if he was not, then he should have known his crew was involved and therefore cannot control his crew. Gotti was called to meet Castellano at the Don's house on Staten Island and told by the boss, Look, Johnny, you better prove that you weren't involved. Castellano also wanted to get copies of the tapes, which were the basis for the indictment. If he didn't, then something might happen to Ruggiero, and Gotti might be removed as captain of the Bergen crew and assigned someplace else. But in the fall of 1983, the nuclear options were still in the distance. Gotti still had Della Croce as his mentor and protector an elder statesman who could hold Castellano at bay and convince him not to do anything to hurt Gotti or his men. At least that would be the way things could remain for a while, until the prosecution turned over tape-recorded evidence and Castellano could learn the truth about the drug dealing. In the meantime, things remained peaceful as well as tense. Ruggiero, Gene Gotti, John Conegli, and the other defendants, at least the ones who weren't fugitives, posted bail and were able to get out of jail. In Angelo's case, he had opposed a $1 million bond, secured by real estate and other assets. 
When the defendants first appeared at their arraignment, they all entered pleas of not guilty. Johnson also noted that Angelo tried to spin the story, that he was merely trying to close out his dead brother's previous dealings with drugs. They denied the charges, and that at least gave them some breathing room with Castellano. As DEA official Jim Hunt remembered, the cover story about Ruggiero closing out Salvatore's interests was the one used to convince Castellano that drug dealing wasn't a major operation of the Bergen crew. There was a lot of money on the street owed to sale, remembered Hunt. That was the argument, that Gotti said he, Ruggiero, was just, he wasn't a drug dealer, he was just trying to get money for Salvatore's kids. Total bullshit. The big bust was not the first indication that the Gotti crew drug dealings had publicly surfaced. And if Castellano had his antenna tuned, he would have seen trouble indications as far back as April 1983. It was then that Ryder was charged with a separate heroin distribution conspiracy, this time with a successor to the infamous Nicky Barnes in Harlem. Until he was busted in the late 1970s, Barnes was the main heroin supplier in Harlem and had amassed a great deal of clout and money. In the Ryder indictment, the evidence was circumstantial, but the indictment charged that Ryder conspired from January 1980 through April 1983 with a small group that included Thelma Grant, who at one time had been an old girlfriend of Barnes and was suspected of taking over his operation when he went to prison in 1977. As it turned out, the government believed that old Herbert Sperling, who had been arrested with Sal Ruggiero back in the 1970s, had been doing time in prison with Barnes in Marion, Illinois, and made a crucial connection in the case. Sperling, investigators said, arranged through Barnes for Ryder and another man to supply heroin to the enterprising Grant, an attractive sex pot who, according to Barnes, would service him sexually in prison during visits. Barnes, fed up with prison life and the prospect of dying behind bars, decided to become a cooperating witness for the government, including while he was arranging for Grant to meet with Ryder's cohorts on heroin deals. He was also angered by the way Grant had stolen his money stash, and how his fellow drug lords on the Harlem-based council kept sleeping with his old girlfriends, including Grant. Barnes turned on Grant and everyone else in the case. Since the evidence was pretty solid against Grant, she decided to plead guilty to the entire nine-count indictment. She also agreed to testify for the government in the case against Ryder. But while prosecutors believe Ryder had been the supplier of heroin for several sales to an undercover agent, Grant denied that Ryder had been part of her drug conspiracy despite having met him in a restaurant. Grant had told an undercover agent cryptically that her source of heroin was a Jew and an Italian, which investigators believed was a veiled reference to Ryder and his friend Salvatore Corallo. But the judge hearing the case entered a judgment of acquittal for Ryder. With various bail packages, or in the case of Ryder a favorable court ruling, most of the Bergen crew and their associates indicted on the heroin case were out on the street. But the world had definitely changed for them. The indictment was serious enough, but for Angelo and John Gotti, there was the added pressure of Castellano. After the drug charges, Castellano's suspicion ramped up. Then, when he learned of the tapes made by the FBI bug, Castellano demanded that they be turned over to him as soon as Ruggiero's lawyers got them in preparation for trial. Ruggiero had been indiscreet in talking about mafia business with non-members, including the bad-mouthing of Castellano, who frankly wasn't liked by many people in the crime family. But apart from embarrassment, the tapes were damning evidence of Ruggiero's guilt in the drug conspiracy, and if Castellano got his hands on the material, he could easily order Ruggiero, and possibly John Gotti, killed. Castellano constantly badgered Daniello della Croce, his underboss and the man who had oversight over the Bergen crew, to get the tapes. Castellano said he needed them for his own defense in the stolen car case, and really didn't care about any indiscreet or embarrassing remarks Ruggiero may have made. Della Croce was feeling the pressure and did the best he could to delay and fend off Castellano, but his frustration showed in one taped conversation with Ruggiero. I've been trying to make you get away with these tapes, said Della Croce, but Jesus Christ Almighty, I can't stop the guy from always bringing it up. Unless I, un, un, unless I tell the guy, Castellano, hey, why don't you go fuck yourself and stop bringing these tapes, these tapes up, then you know, what are we going to do then? We... We go and roll it up and go to war. I don't want that, said Angelo. No, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. Della Croce tried to get Angelo to see that a fatal conflict with Castellano was the absolute last step, but that everybody should take a deep breath and take it easy. But there was always the chance that things could get bloody if the issue of the tapes continued to fester. 
De La Croce also seemed to indicate that Angela was being too self-absorbed and selfish. I ain't saying you're wrong, said De La Croce. Don't forget. Don't only consider yourself. You know, you got a lot of other fellas, you know, fellas, too, that you like. And a lot of other fellas that get hurt, too. Not only you could get hurt, I could get hurt. He could get hurt. Uh, a lot of other fellas could, could get hurt. For what? For what? Over, over because you don't want to show them the tapes? It was unlikely that Della Croce knew the full contents of the tapes, which Angelo had only alluded to as being embarrassing. But there was an added complication looming. Castellano himself had been the object of a bug in his own house, and while he was still months away from learning about that, once he did his anger against Ruggiero, as well as Della Croce and Gatti for their lack of candor and control over the talkative mobster, would rise to an unprecedented level. Chapter 9 I ain't giving them tapes up. Paul Castellano began to learn just how badly he had been served by Angela Ruggiero and the rest of the Bergen crew, when on February 25, 1985, FBI agents Joe O'Brien and Andres Kearns arrested him at the Toad Hill White House in a gigantic case involving him and the other bosses who made up the commission. The indictment was aimed at the ruling body of the New York Mafia, charged along with Castellano, Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, the street boss of the Genovese family, Anthony Tony Ducks Corallo, boss of the Lucchese family, Carmine the Snake Persico, who headed the Colombo family, the Bonanno family boss, Philip Rostelli, was the fifth commission member, but he was not indicted on some of the charges, as the FBI had learned that the Bonanno group had not been sitting on the ruling panel because of past drug involvement in its previous infiltration by undercover FBI agent Joseph Pistone. The idea of roping Castellano and the other bosses into one racketeering indictment had come from then-Manhattan U.S. Attorney Rudolph Giuliani, after he read Joseph Bonanno's book, Man of Honor, published in 1983. In it, Bonanno described the operation of the commission, and Giuliani saw the body essentially as one big racketeering conspiracy. One particular focus of the case had been the Mafia family's involvement in the so-called Concrete Club, a cartel which lorded over the ready-mix concrete industry in New York. The crime families required that all concrete jobs over $2 million be handled through the club, which divvied up the contracts in return for a $2 per cubic yard fee, which went to the bosses of the crime families. It turned out that the FBI learned about the operation of the club, in part through the bug in Castellano's house, where he often went on to talk about the payments. Of course, when Castellano was first arrested by O'Brien and Currens, he didn't know that his own words had caused so much trouble. The two agents showed up at 177 Benedict Road and, after knocking on the door, told Castellano he was being arrested for racketeering. It was actually the second federal indictment against him in the last year. Castellano had been charged in 1984 for being part of the DeMeo stolen car racket. Leading the agents into the house, Castellano took them to the kitchen, where his maid and mistress, Gloria Olarte, was preparing a roast beef dinner. Castellano's daughter, Connie, was there with her husband. Castellano's personal physician was also there for dinner. Castellano asked if he could change into a suit, and O'Brien and Currens consented. The mafia boss returned after a short interval, dressed in a double-breasted blue suit, and kissed his family goodbye. Both his wife Nina and Gloria began to cry, and at that, Castellano decided to leave with the agents in the government car. Currens drove and O'Brien sat in the back with Castellano for the ride. For security, another FBI car drove in front. Although the agents could have handcuffed Castellano for the ride, they didn't, something he appreciated. Just before Castellano left his home, his doctor gave him a shot of insulin and gave the packet of syringes and the medication to O'Brien and Currens. It was unclear when Castellano might be freed on bail, so he needed the insulin with him. Once in the car, possibly because his blood sugar was running low from not having eaten, Castellano told the agents he felt a bit ill and asked them to get him something to eat. O'Brien knew the diabetes condition and told the driver of the car to stop by a deli so they could get some chocolate bars. The driver at first refused. He had orders to drive Castellano straight to Manhattan, where his arrest would be processed. But pulling his weight as the case agent, O'Brien insisted they stop and some candy bars were purchased and given to a grateful Castellano. As they continued on the drive, Currens and O'Brien didn't say a word at first about the bugging to Castellano. But as the two agents later recalled, Castellano heard about it over the car radio, and the shock of the news prompted him to lean forward to listen more intently 
to the news bulletin. Castellano was troubled enough by the realization that the bug had picked him up discussing criminal conduct and insulting some of his colleagues, particularly the Bergen crew. But he was also concerned that the microphone had recorded his sexual escapades with Gloria. O'Brien tried to reassure Castellano that the government didn't listen to personal stuff, although it would later surface very explicitly in the agent's book, published in 1992. Castellano wasn't persuaded by their assurance that they didn't listen to the salacious things he and Gloria did, and as it turned out, he would be right. Actually, news that the government had taped Castellano, as well as some of the other bosses, had been revealed in the New York Times about a week before the arrest. Citing law enforcement officials, the newspaper said that conversations picked up by various bugs provided critical evidence that may result in the joint indictments of the reputed leaders of New York City's five major organized crime families. State investigators with Organized Crime Task Force had bugged the Black Jaguar of Corallo and, as one official said, discovered evidence that rivaled anything he had heard in the past two decades. The article also referenced Castellano, saying evidence had also been obtained from electronic eavesdropping by the FBI of his home on Staten Island. When the car with Castellano reached Manhattan, O'Brien saw the crowd of reporters and photographers around the federal building opposite the courthouse at Foley Square. It was a mob scene of sorts, and O'Brien wanted to avoid subjecting Castellano to a press crush. To do that, O'Brien ordered the driver to go around the block and park on a grassy area by the federal building, away from the crowd. With Castellano in hand, the agents took him into the building for processing before he was taken to the courthouse. At his arraignment the next day in Manhattan Federal Court, Castellano was represented by his longtime attorney, James La Rosa. With the help of his family, Castellano put together a bail package of $2 million, which was on top of the $2 million he had posted in the car theft case. It was a great deal of money to put up, although Castellano did have the property to secure the bond. Once back home, Castellano had much to think about, and much of it wasn't good. He now faced two major federal indictments. The DeMeo stolen car ring case was put together with the help of informants and cooperating witnesses. Castellano's own greed had made him a target there. The commission case was constructed in large measure from the bug in his house, and Castellano soon learned that it was the Ruggiero tapes which had given the government the probable cause to wire up his mans in Toad Hill. Everything traced back to the loudmouth Ruggiero, and to some extent his street boss and good friend, John Gotti. Castellano had prided himself on being discreet and careful in his telephone conversations, so the fact that his mansion, with all its security devices and the two Dobermans, was invaded by the FBI stunned him. He went on a remodeling rampage, replacing his entire kitchen, its equipment, and the dinette area. The bugging device, by that time long deactivated, was never found. There seemed to be other problems looming for Castellano. Succession is something smart mafia bosses always contemplated, and in Castellano's case, the flurry of indictments, which began in 1983, made him wonder where he could turn. Complicating things further was the fact that his aging underboss, Della Croce, was steadily losing his battle with cancer so it was doubtful that he could reliably assume command of anything if Castellano himself was convicted in any of the federal cases arrayed against him. There was also the suspicion that Della Croce was, like his Bergen crew, somehow dabbling in drugs through some New Jersey members of the Gambino family. Despite his illness, Della Croce remained a target for the federal government, and in March 1985, just a month after Castellano had been arrested on the commission case, he was charged in United States of America v. Agnello Della Croce et al. The case was aimed at the Bergen crew, including John Gotti, Anthony Rapino, and Willie Boy Johnson. It was a contentious prosecution. The probe had been led by an earnest, if not stubborn, assistant U.S. attorney named Diane Jacqueline, who was working at the Brooklyn U.S. Attorney's Office. FBI agents like Joe O'Brien and his supervisor Bruce Mao saw that Jacqueline's prosecution was riddled with problems. The evidence just wasn't there, and other federal officials believed it was doomed to failure. One federal prosecutor in Brooklyn, Edward McDonald, who worked with the organized crime strike force, believed that if Jacqueline's case faltered that the Bergen crew might be protected based on principles of double jeopardy from ever being indicted again federally. Jacqueline, a thin, tall, dark-haired woman of Italian ethnicity, was backed by her immediate superiors and persisted in pushing the case. Since the FBI was not backing her, Jacqueline didn't have the benefit of the Ruggiero tapes. There were more problems looming. 
At the arraignment on the case, Jack Alone told the presiding judge, Eugene Nickerson, that Johnson had been an informant for the FBI for over 15 years. The news was devastating. It almost seemed that Jack Alone was willing to sacrifice Johnson to the mob. Not only was Johnson now outed to the mob as an informant, his utility to the FBI was thrown away. Since he didn't want to go into the witness protection program, Nickerson said he had to deny Johnson bail for his protection. Della Croce, getting progressively weaker, was arraigned at his bedside. Unknown to Nickerson and Jack alone, Della Croce's home had already been bugged by the FBI. But to avoid potential problems, the FBI turned off the device for the arraignment. On June 8, 1985, Della Croce held court at his home with Ruggiero and John Gotti to rehash the tape issue. Castellano kept bugging Della Croce for transcripts of the Ruggiero house bug. Ruggiero was adamant about not turning them over. If you two never bother with me again, I ain't giving them tapes up. I can't, said Angelo. Della Croce and Gotti tried to browbeat Angelo into turning the material over to Castellano. Well, he's the boss. You have to do what he tells you, said Gotti. But Angelo was not going to turn over the tapes since he knew it spelled the end for him if he did. The tapes were filled with drug trafficking evidence, and Castellano would have been justified in killing Ruggiero and possibly Gotti. A bloodbath was a distinct possibility. It was later revealed that by mid-1985, John Gotti, his brother Gene, as well as Angelo and John Carneglia were getting information that Castellano was thinking of cleaning house and having them killed. The source of that tidbit for the FBI was Willie Boy Johnson, who was feeding information to both the Fed's and the Queen's district attorney's office. The atmosphere for the Gambino Borgata was indeed poisonous. Aware that he might be convicted in either of the two major federal cases and sent to prison, Castellano held a conclave at his home with Gotti in June 1985 to lay out his plan for the future. For a peaceful transition, Castellano, after Del Croce died. Although there was no bug in Castellano's house at that point, other surveillance evidence surfaced in which Gotti was heard saying that the boss proposed a three-part ruling committee with day-to-day -day control of family split between Tommy Gambino, Gotti, and Tommy Bellotti. Three-man committees would be proposed later in the mob, but as author John H. Davis observed, the situation was an organizational disaster waiting to happen for the Gambino family. It was an unrealistic solution, said Davis. Although Gotti got along well enough with Tommy Gambino, he detested the impetuous Tommy Bellotti, whom he once referred to as fucking lug-headed scumbag. Another Gambino gangster, Sammy the Bull Gravano, had his own insights into Castellano's mind. Gravano, a beefy killer born in Brooklyn, who was initially part of the Castellano faction, believed that the boss would shake things up when Della Croce died. John Gotti had a lot at stake in what could happen. I think John did give a fuck when Neil Della Croce died, which we all knew would happen sooner or later, Gravano remembered later in conversations with writer Peter Moss. He's going to break John down to a soldier, stick him somewhere in a crew, maybe under Joe Butch, Corraro, Without even being dead, he is finished. Acostolano's plans for succession involved Gotti. The leader of the Bergen crew had actually become more powerful now that Della Croce was edging closer to death. Infirm and unable to make his rounds to visit other mobsters, Della Croce couldn't make his way to visit his favorite club, the Ravenite, at 247 Mulberry Street. In his younger days, Della Croce lorded over the club, and if he was having a bad afternoon, would sometimes be seen by surveillance cops kicking the German shepherd, which liked to sleep on the steps. The Ravenite, the origin of its name was uncertain, was one of those little Italy storefronts with a large glass window at the front. Inside were card tables and espresso machines. Nothing fancy here. The old-time gangsters loved hanging out there, and local people had a habit of spotting police and FBI surveillance vans. With Della Croce bedridden, Gotti began using the Ravenite as his de facto Manhattan headquarters doing the bidding of his underboss and acting as the Gambino family's big shot in Manhattan. This was time of uncertainty in the Borgata. Castellano, facing two major indictments and an imminent trial in one of them, the stolen car case, had to hunker down with his lawyers. Already a distant boss who stayed aloof of his blue-collar crews, Castellano became increasingly cut off from things. He apparently even stopped pressing the Il Della Croce for the Ruggiero tapes. He had his own tapes to worry about but he also remained hungry for money, something that continued to be a source of irritation among his own men and some of the other mafia bosses. Even Della Croce had complained about the avaricious ways of bosses like Castellano. 
once telling Ruggiero about the way the ruling commission, during a meeting over the construction industry, could talk about nothing but money, money, money. As 1985 ground on, Castellano went on trial in the stolen car ring case. The mob operation was believed to have shipped hundreds of cars to places like Kuwait for a profit of about $3,000 in every vehicle. Castellano's cut was said to be $20,000 in a wad of bills delivered to his house on Toad Hill each week. The list of the other charges were ugly. Prosecutors allege that the ring, run by the now dead, homicidal Roy DeMeo, had committed up to 25 murders. There was no direct claim that Castellano took part in the killings. But as a charged member of the conspiracy, Castellano could be found liable for the killings. While his defense attorney believed he had a shot at getting an acquittal, there was little evidence that Castellano was actively on the scene of the auto theft ring that didn't prevent his name from coming up. On November 4, 1985, in Manhattan Federal Court, Vito Arena, a 43-year-old gangster who was serving an 18-year prison term for murder and car theft, testified that he had been reliably told a number of times that Castellano was the boss of the operation. Then there was testimony about Castellano getting the cash hauls once a week as his cut of the proceeds. True, the witnesses had their own baggage and problems of credibility. But if Castellano wanted to preserve any image he might have of being just a successful businessman, the testimony stripped away that veneer. The witness who seemed to do the most to portray Castellano as a mobster was another man not yet 40 years old. Dominic Montiglio, 37, was the nephew of Anthony Nino Gaghi, one of Castellano's key captains and one of the co-defendants on trial in the case. Testifying for the government, Montiglio recalled that one occasion when he was acting as a collector for his uncle that he delivered a wad of $100 bills to Castellano at his meat market. Castellano, said Montiglio, was often portrayed as the boss and leader of our organization. Yet Castellano had qualms about the brutal way De Mayo and some of the other killers did business, knocking off rivals. Castellano's squeamishness was portrayed in a conversation Montiglio said he overheard between Gaghi and the crime boss, discussing the murder of rival car thief John Quinn and his girlfriend, Cherry Golden. Both were killed in 1977, and Castellano seemed upset that the woman was murdered and her body found stuffed under the dashboard of an abandoned Lincoln Continental on the street in Coney Island. Mr. Castellano asked my uncle why this girl Cherry was killed, recalled Montiglio. My uncle told him she was part of the operation of Quinn and something about him going to the law and he had to be taken care of. But like any government witness who abandons the life of crime in the hopes of getting a break, Montiglio had issues which later started to raise questions about his candor and credibility. For instance, it came out that he had waited almost two years, about till the eve of the trial, to tell investigators that Castellano was involved with the car theft ring. To make matters worse, Montiglio admitted lying to the grand jury when he denied knowing details which would have tied Castellano to the ring. Montiglio also admitted having committed perjury two years earlier. The questions about Montiglio came after other witnesses had created problems. Some failed to identify or misidentify defendants as being part of the auto ring. Another called a different government witness a liar. These were things that happened in complicated federal megatrials, as big courtroom spectacles were known. But the impact on some trial observers was that the government was having a hard time. The morning of December 15, the headline on the New York Times story about Castellano's trial would no doubt have gratified him and his lawyer James LaRosa. Another setback for prosecution in case against Gambino Group, blared the headline. If you were one of the defendants, it was not a bad way to start the day.